Welcome everyone. We, our next presentation is by Gary Lenz, the main line to Wilmar. So over to you, Gary. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yes, I live here in uh, the town of Winston, Minnesota, about seven miles off the main line. I grew up uh, spending time at my grandparents' place in Montrose, watching the uh, Great Northern in the early 60s, early to mid 60s. And our opening slide here, you can see we have a couple of uh, uh, a couple of Rockies. Rocky the Great Northern Goat mascot for the railroad, of course, and the other Minnesota Rocky is Rocky the Flying Squirrel from Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. He and his pal Bullwinkle Moose used to have a cartoon show on that I watched. And one of the uh, uh, segments of the show uh, had uh, Sh Sherman and Peabody. And uh, it was a boy and his dog, uh, Sherman and his boy and his dog, Mr. Peabody. And they had at their disposal a wayback machine that allowed them to travel through time. So as we travel uh, linearly from Minneapolis out to Wilmer, we're going to have to jump around in time because it would be very difficult to put all of this together you know, uh, in a, a time frame uh, that is linear. Uh, also a, on a somber note here in the bottom, I just learned a few days ago that a gentleman that helped me immensely, a fellow by the name of Bob Ranchad, uh, who worked a couple decades as a uh, great Northern uh, telegrapher, uh, passed away a little over a week ago. So I wanted to, uh, I added some information about telegraphy and uh, wanted to, uh, you know, honor Bob by, uh, you know, doing a slideshow. So we'll get started here. First of all, with uh, this gentleman, one of the uh, uh, surveyors that was involved in laying out the main line from Minneapolis uh, out to Wilmer. Uh, his name is uh, Benjamin Franklin Christley, and he uh, was uh, born in Pennsylvania went to school to study mathematics and engineering. And in 1859, he had relocated up to Long Lake, Minnesota and was employed by the St. Paul and Pacific to survey their lands and, and lay out the right of way. And he is given credit for uh, laying out the original right of way from Minneapolis, west of Delano. Uh, he also worked for a couple other roads, the Minneapolis and St. Louis and the Northern Pacific. And, for those of you that are Minnesota railroad buffs, he had uh, talked in 1874 in a Minneapolis Tribune article about the possibility of laying down a uh, narrow gauge line from Minneapolis up to Osseo, uh, from Osseo west over to Rockford. And then uh, from Rockford, they would go up the South Fork of the Crow River uh, all through Delano out to Watertown and then Hutchinson. Uh, he also got out of the surveying business, went uh, into the general store business in Long Lake and served as a politician and, and passed away out in California at age 64. But uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chrisley was also uh, one of the uh, surveyors that worked with uh, David Shepard and Eugen Smith. And Eugen Smith uh, lent his name when he surveyed, he was out surveying in 1858 to the town of Smith Lake, and we'll be visiting there in a little bit. But I wanted to show you this first uh, picture or this first map showing the layout of the, uh, in 1870, of the uh, St. Paul and Pacific line, the branch line from Minneapolis up to St. Cloud, and the main line going from Minneapolis out to Wilmer. And as you can see in this map uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, glacier that the last glacier that covered uh, the state of Minnesota up to a mile thick in some spots. And when it melted back, it left us with 10,000 lakes as we claim on our license plates. It also left where most of the main line lies, uh, several moraines or hills, uh, glacial hills that the railroad had to uh, uh, construct their line through. Uh, also in that, and it's not shown on this map, but from the Southeast corner of the state of Minnesota, up to the Northwest, if you draw a line diagonally, uh, the, everything to the right of that line was covered with the big woods, you know, uh, uh, conifer and deciduous trees. Uh, down in this part uh, was mostly, uh, you know, hardwood trees. Uh, so those had to, uh, not only when they built the railroad, did they have to work with, you know, getting, uh, you know, leveling the hills and cutting through hills and filling in the sags. Uh, they also had to clear a lot of timber. And uh, that was being done by this uh, all, all the way back in 1858. So several of the early settlers were originally hired by the railroad to 
uh, clear the uh, trees in preparation for the graders to come in and put in the right of way. Now, the Great Northern, of course, has mountainous divisions, but this part of Minnesota is relatively flat, as you can see in this uh, topological uh, uh, view here uh, from Minneapolis out to the uh, uh, hill out by Candy Ojai is a total of 413 feet, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, elevation. So, uh, you know, in the 100 miles, they didn't have any really terribly steep grades. Uh, there is a couple of uh, rivers that you go through and west of Delano, you can see I uh, showed where the, uh, we have a little valley for the Crow River and Washington Creek out between Dassel and Darwin is another uh, fairly wide valley. I uh, had mentioned that there were moraines and in, in this map here showing the Minneapolis area in the uh, early 1870s, uh, we have several things going on. Starting in the lower left corner, you can see there's a double sided arrow drawn across Cedar Lake. And originally when the railroad crossed over from St. Anthony in the uh, upper right side of your screen, when they came up from St. Paul, they stopped by St. Anthony Falls there in the town of St. Anthony. Uh, in 1867, they laid a the, uh, track uh, across Nicollet Island with one bridge and then a second bridge to cross from Nicollet Island in the middle of the Mississippi River to the Western Bank of uh, the river, which you know is now the city of uh, Minneapolis. And uh, I have in the dotted lines here outlined a couple of the uh, big hills that the railroad had to pass in between in the valley of Bassett's Creek uh, on their approach to uh, you know get into the uh, mill district of Minneapolis. Uh, one of them, the more famous one, is called Kenwood Hill. Uh, and uh, the uh, there's also in here, uh, the, you can see in the lower left corner of the uh, map, another railroad line coming up. That was the Minneapolis and St. Louis main line that uh, by Cedar Lake paralleled the uh, St. Paul and Pacific into downtown Minneapolis. Uh, I've delineated with some numbers here, one, two, three, four, uh, the various depots that uh, were uh, one, two, and three were owned by the St. Paul and Pacific or Great Northern. Uh, the fourth one is the newest depot here. The other three are gone. And we have some pictures. Oh, one other thing I want to mention. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving here, but this is the Minnesota Central, which is the, came up, it was eventually became the Milwaukee Road, but that arrived in Minneapolis uh, by the falls in 1865. So the St. Paul and Pacific didn't get across the river until a couple of years later. Uh, and there was no connection between the two. Eventually, the uh, Minneapolis and St. Louis uh, was constructed by Washburn to uh, approach the milling district. He was uh, a fairly prominent miller in the Minneapolis area and was an early promoter of the M and St. L. This is a, a, a picture here taken by Upton in 1874 of the first St. Paul and Pacific Depot in Minneapolis. Uh, you can see the people are standing, you know, there's a stack of wood and ties. That is Washington Avenue, uh, kind of a main drag that runs east and west. And behind the, there are three steam locomotives in this picture. Behind the one with the diamond stack here is the St. Paul and Pacific uh, Passenger Depot. Uh, there's another train uh, stop between the Passenger Depot and the Freight Depot that was across the track. And finally, going through the elevator, uh, there's a steam locomotive, which a couple of the books I've seen mention is the uh, locomotive Wyzetta, number 12, St. Paul and Pacific Wyzetta, which is, I believe, one of the last uh, locomotives to be shipped up uh, to the uh, St. Paul and Pacific via barge on the Mississippi River. Uh, after the uh, Minnesota Central got in, they, of course, were able to send all their supplies in via uh, rail, uh, via rail connection. This is the uh, second depot. In 1884, this depot was constructed very hard along the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, the track, you can see the track shed, the archway there covered the uh, tracks in, in the rivers just down below there. And this, this stayed in, in operation until 1913. And of course, the city of Minneapolis experienced tremendous growth at this time. And so one of the things they had to do was 
uh, train traffic was, you know, snarling with foot traffic and horse traffic at that time. So uh, the uh, Manitoba Road in 1880, 1892, excuse me, uh, embarked upon a grade separation project. And they lowered the main line basically uh, from the Mississippi River going south several blocks. And in the earlier Upton view, we showed a picture of Washington Avenue with a grain elevator in the depot. In 1892, looking south, you can see the bridge for Washington Avenue crossing the tracks, which had been lowered um, in this grade. And of course, the tracks to the right are the, uh, you know, what are now the Great Northern or Burlington Northern tracks, which are still there. The Minneapolis and St. Louis were the leftmost uh, trackage uh, in this in this picture, and the uh, uh, there was a lot of industrial development done along here. Uh, you know, in the early 1900s, you know, in the 20s and 30s, uh, Henry Ford built a plant for producing model uh, you know Model T, Model A Fords in this area. Uh, there was a Buick factory. Uh, uh, Harry Pence had a uh, franchise to build Buick automobiles. Honeywell started out in had a factory in this area along these tracks. And all the way up until the 80s, it was uh, you know, a heavy industrial area, lots of industrial buildings, which have now been repurposed to restaurants and, and residential areas. And it's not the same what it is, but the uh, mainline track is still there. And this is the third depot uh, that again was built across the street from the second depot. Uh, to the right of this picture would be the Mississippi River and this is the area that the, uh, uh, you know, I rode the Empire Builder out of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this facility back in the, well, I guess 77, maybe it was 78. It was shortly before it was closed and abandoned and torn down, but it's a very attractive structure. Uh, it was demolished. Amtrak decided to move their operation to the uh, Midtown District between Minneapolis, Midway District between Minneapolis and uh, St. Paul in a more modern one-story structure that wasn't quite as grand as this. So Minneapolis after 1978 didn't have a uh, train station downtown until we get to what I call the fourth depot. And this is uh, a combination. This is farther down the street uh, between Fifth Street and Seventh uh, where the, uh, uh, the Minnesota Twins uh, constructed a new field with public participation. And you can see in this picture, uh, you know, this is the uh, this is the main line running along here through the cut, and that's also used for the North Star commuter rail line that runs well. It was supposed to run all the way to St. Cloud, I think it stops now, but by Clearwater, but they have an intersection here of the uh, North Star, uh, you know, commuter rail and also the light rail lane running down Fifth Street, and so uh, it's kind of a one that you can still catch a train and still ride on the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, main line uh, up to the Mississippi River, or a little bit beyond this, where they have a yard for uh, storing the uh, commuter rail cars. Uh, you know, they come in during the morning and they're stored there during the day, and then in the evening they take off and haul folks back up the old original St. Paul Pacific branch line up through Anoka. If you go a little further west from downtown Minneapolis, uh, you'll come to the town of Wyzetta. And uh, this photograph was taken in 1961 inside of the Wyzetta Depot, which is still standing uh, along the tracks. It's the, uh, the only other depot that's still along the tracks. To my knowledge, between Minneapolis and Wilmer is the uh, new facility in Wilmer. Uh, you can see here that I have highlighted with a couple of red arrows, uh, a couple items I'd like to draw your attention to. The, the bottom one by uh, Agent Rossler's head is a patch panel uh, that was used to, uh, uh, for troubleshooting of all the telephone and telegraph wires that run on the open wire line uh, along that paralleled the tracks, usually on the south side out to Wilmer. The top two wooden boxes with bells on them are called selectors. And there were two telephone lines uh, that ran out uh, to between Minneapolis and Wilmer. Uh, that connected up to the depots and phone booths. And one wire was called the dispatcher wire, when quite naturally the Wilmer dispatcher was always listening, you, either with headphones or a loudspeaker, so that if you picked up a phone and you could call him, you could communicate with him. Uh, the other one was called a message line. Now, if the dispatcher wanted to ring up somebody in a depot, each depot had a selector, and he would uh, send a, a 
code, uh, a pulse code out to uh, these selectors and ring a bell. First though, I'd like to show you the patch panel. And uh, as I said earlier, we're kind of paying homage there to Bob and all the telegraphers. Uh, there were a total of 10 telegraph wires on the pole line that ran along the tracks and four telephone wires on the first two cross arms. The third uh, cross arm was added by the signal department when the line was rebuilt in 1923. And that carried usually a minimum of three signal wires, sometimes more. But the telephone telegraph department wires, those 14 wires were bought into these patch panels and they located patch panels like this in Wilmer, Delano, Litchfield and uh, Wyzetta. And of course, this was done if there were problems on the line, they could break the wire, insert grounds, hook up test equipment. That's what all of these uh, jack panels are used for. And the, and the lines or the wires had uh, numbers assigned to them. And you can see in the little box, uh, the uh, numbers designated if they were true through telegraph circuits or were Western Union owned wires. Western Union wires were up there with the Great Northern wires. Uh, there were uh, uh, local wires for railroad use, telephone circuits, numbers 500 to 599 were uh, telephone circuits used by the dispatcher and the message wire. And of course, uh, number 600, like 625 here, was a telegraph wire that uh, ran from Wyzetta down uh, to the Hutch branch to the town of Hutchinson, Minnesota. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hutchinson, Minnesota. The other, uh, this slide here, uh, is the other uh, red arrow that has drawn your attention to the picture of the selector. I opened those up when I was at the YZ Depot, which by the way, is still an active museum. You can visit there if you come up here. Uh, they, they have uh, quite a bit of uh, this equipment uh, in place. And uh, you can see when you open up the cabinet, the little glass and case device is the selector itself. And what that did, it would receive these impulses sent by the dispatcher from his dispatching uh, uh, keying machine. And if the right sequence of pulses were received, for example, you can see on the glass case, it says 377. If the uh, right sequence of pulses was received, uh, it would ring the bell by rotating down in this area. Uh, well, we'll start here. There, is, there are a couple magnets here that would attract an armature, which is connected to a mechanical clock worth with uh, you know ratcheted gears and, and teeth and palms or paws, and uh, at that would rotate this wheel. And this wheel is designated here. If you can see my cursor pointing to it, the green arrow points to the contact that would ring the bell. But the three white arrows here show the spacing of the pins that are uniquely spaced for each individual depot. And as the wheel turned, it would catch on this little lever here. Uh, you know, at the right, at the proper pulse and hold until the next series of pulses came through to uh, uh, go to work and uh, uh, ring the bell and notify the depot agent that they're, you know, that the dispatcher wanted to speak with him. Oops, just a minute. I do have a little short video. Hopefully this comes through, but I did shoot a video. It's only a couple seconds long of this thing in operation. And you can see here, it, you can see the, uh, uh, levers moving and the wheel turning and the bell ringing. I, I hope you can hear the bell ringing. I don't know if the audio is going through on this, but uh, uh, this is another view inside of the depot. And this has some historical significance in that the red arrow here is pointing to the uh, levers that operate the train order signal, which you can see the mast for the train order signal right out the window of the uh, Mr. Rossler's, uh, by Mr. Rossler's head. He is sitting, of course, in the chair operating a telegraph key called the Vibroplex Bug. Uh, most people are familiar with the telegraph key that you tap and go up and down. But if you do that very long, you're, you're going to get carpal tunnel syndrome. Back uh, you know, before there were computers, people, telegraphers experienced that. So they invented uh, a, a key that would operate by flipping left or right, going horizontally, uh, easier to use. And, you can see he's, uh, his hands are on the key and he is uh, sending a message out on the uh, wire out to the town of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hutchinson. Uh, there's here a jack box that shows him plugged into, this is the well, one of the wires that was bought in, allowed him to connect his key to Hutchinson and send Morse code. The other uh, jack here is enabling the telephone 
to talk on circuit 527, which is the dispatcher telephone circuit. And uh, this, uh, there's, there's a little bit of history here. The uh, last telegraph circuit or the last telegram uh, that I have found sent on the uh, line out to YZ was um, the depot agent in YZ, Bill O'Laughlin in 1966, sent a message to a coworker in St. Paul. And about an hour later, the uh, whole telegraph facility was deactivated and then they communicated via telephone, uh, via the two telephone circuits. This is a 1954 view of the depot and it still looks pretty much the same today. If you travel to YZ, the difference being is the train order signal has been removed and placed to the left side of the picture out of view here, there's kind of a little garden. Uh, so it, it of course cannot be you know, in place along the tracks because uh, they don't use that anymore. And the other main difference is that instead of uh, two tracks, uh, they single tracked us several years ago. Uh, it used to be double tracked from Minneapolis uh, all the way out to the town of Delano. And uh, uh, we, as you go west of YZ, uh, this is a rather significant picture here because this is where in about 1913, the Loose Line Railroad, and now it, it was abandoned, it's called the Loose Line Trail, but its official name was Electric Short Line Railway. And that was built by the Loose family. Uh, they sold common stock to everybody. They crossed the Great Northern Main Line between YZ and Long Lake with this structure here uh, that was uh, eventually saved, it's still in existence today, it was saved. But this is a view, 1913, of the crew stopping on the tracks and having their picture taken. Now, uh, down here in the ribbon at the bottom, in 1948, uh, I did find some documentation where the Great Northern explored the possibility of possibly purchasing the loose line and consolidating uh, their trackage with the uh, loose line because uh, the loose line also went to Hutchinson and all the way out to Glick and Clara City. So they, they talked about, uh, explored the possibility of doing that and they would wanted to uh, explore ways of connecting the two facilities together. One was to build a ramp track from the Great Northern Main Line up to the loose line here and it would have back in 1948 cost about $250,000. Another option was uh, uh, to connect uh, west of YZ, they could have laid, or excuse me, uh, uh, out by Watertown, they could have laid a trackage uh, to connect uh, Watertown uh, to Maple uh, along the, uh, uh, connect the loose line to the Great Northern Hutch Branch at the town of Maple, which is on the North Shore of uh, Lake Waconia by Waconia. And finally, in Hutchinson itself, they could have bridged the Crow River with a $70,000 bridge and connected the loose line there uh, with uh, the uh, Hutch branch in the city of Hutchinson. But where this picture was taken, uh, my daughter and I came down there in, uh, oh, probably 2004, where I was still very young. And I was standing about the same spot on that, uh, where on the loose line trail when a uh, BN freight was westbound and I snapped a picture and you can see here, uh, this is when they had be started to begin construction of relocating the, the uh, original main line uh, to the left or to the south to make room for limited access version of Highway 12. And uh, so I highlighted in red arrow where the signal cabin, which is basically in the same spot, uh, stands, but the tracks were, were moved to the left. So in the top color photograph, you can see uh, the little white dots here delineate the new limited access version of Highway 12, which bypasses Long Lake and Maple Plain. Uh, the old Highway 12 is uh, runs along here. You can see it in gray. I, I highlighted it here with a uh, uh, little gray banner. And here where it's a sawmill location, that was uh, uh, where the, uh, there used to be a sawmill there in the town of Long Lake, hard fast down along the lake. And of course the original depot and stuff was down here where I have my cursor. It was eventually moved here to the left. Uh, when they, after they relocated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the railroad the, uh, and the part of restructuring everything here, the original trestle that I showed you where the gas electric cars parked with the guys was moved over here over or to replace the old wooden trestle that crossed Highway 12. So that trestle still exists today in a very nice, attractive new trestle. Uh, it carries the loose line trail over the Highway 12 bypass there. 
just east of Long Lake. And you can get off of 394 and take old Highway 12 through the town of Long Lake. But uh, if you're in a hurry, you take the bypass. And that's quite a bit of time off of commuting. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, I had mentioned that the main line was double tracked from Minneapolis all the way out to Delano. And we have here a picture of Delano back in the day when they still had a water tank here. You can see in the map above where the double track ends here, just west of the depot. But uh, I highlighted here with a red arrow where the railroad built a dam in the Crow River, which flows from the bottom to the top here, and used that dam uh, to uh, place an intake for a pump that was located on the banks of the river. And they pumped uh, water on a pipe all the way back to this water tower, which is located here uh, in uh, where this other red arrow is delineated. And that, that was uh, used, uh, Delano was a water stop for many years until the end of steam. The other one being out at Smith Lake, and we'll get out there in a minute. Uh, a third place was, of course, the town of uh, Dassel. So there were three watering stations between Wilmer and, and uh, the Twin Cities. This is a view of, uh, of the uh, town of Montrose. Uh, this is a, a picture we got from Mr. Grebe's collection uh, taken by John Melvin on Labor Day in 1956 in Montrose on Main Street, uh, showing the old uh, siding that used to run from Montrose, Montrose west to the town of Waverly. Uh, when I was a boy, I used to stand in about the same spot that uh, Mr. Melvin took his photograph. Uh, and uh, so it, it brings back a lot of memories. I can just barely remember steam locomotives back in the day. If you go west down the uh, main line and the siding track, just east of the Waverly, just before the curve is where uh, Mr. Melvin took a second photograph. It was undated, but I uh, circled up on the uh, telegraph wire or the telephone line on the signal arm. I circled those two wires. Those were the code line built for centralized traffic control, which of course allows the dispatcher to uh, control, remotely control switches at uh, control points. And uh, so we know this photograph was taken after that and obviously before uh, steam was abandoned, uh, you know, 57. Now, most people, you know, most everybody agrees that steam kind of fizzled out in 57, but there are a couple of residents in Waverly swear to me that in October 59, one last steam engine went through before the American Freedom Train in 1976. So uh, hopefully someday somebody will find some documentation to support uh, what Ed and Sue Clausen have told me that they both distinctly remember that train coming through when they were in school in the town of Waverly. Going west from Waverly, we come to Howard Lake and uh, it's kind of neat. This photograph on the bottom is a picture of the old St. Paul and Pacific Depot here. Uh, where the first red arrow is located on the left there, that today would be directly south of the Wright County Fairgrounds in Howard Lake. There's a street here in the middle called Rudsell Avenue, and they originally proposed to move the St. Paul and Pacific Depot over here to this location, but they didn't do that. They instead moved it way over here by St. Paul Street, which is behind the city hall of Howard, the old city hall of Howard Lake. And the short red arrows here designate where they had proposed to reroute the main line. And the reason they wanted to do that is because when they got to Howard Lake, they had to make this rather radical curve around the bay, the South Bay of Howard Lake. So the railroad back in the early 1900s, 1908, simply filled in the lake and straightened out their tracks. Where you see all of these telephone and telegraph poles, that's Highway 12 runs there yet today. Uh, Highway 12 in the 1930s was rerouted to the south side of the tracks, but uh, back when this was taken, Highway 12 ran along the north side of the tracks between Waverly and Howard Lake. And if you come into the town of Howard Lake today on Highway 12, you will be about riding on Highway 12 where these telephone poles are, so you're perilously close to the original alignment of the uh, original St. Paul and Pacific Railroad track that was laid out by Chris Lieb and, and, and others. Uh, uh, when they surveyed the original line. Now this is uh, a view of some of the construction that went on. The small photograph shows X-284, uh, which is a uh, 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 some sort of a grading uh, device, you know, for uh, leveling the, the ground. And this bottom picture shows the uh, 1905 to 1918 view of the depot where it originally sat at the base of uh, St. Paul Street. 
And these two buildings here, if you can see my cursor, the brick building and the white building are still there today. The depot, of course, is gone. And there's only one track uh, between the, the uh, depot and the lake. And they had to move the depot in uh, the 1940s to make room to, uh, uh, they moved the depot to the south and east to make room for the passing track to be extended uh, all the way west to the east side of, excuse me, east to the east side of Howard Lake. So now there are two tracks along the lake bank. The original depot used to stand right about in here. Uh, and this picture was, the bottom picture was taken by Aaron Benning in 1965. You can see the, the pole line runs hard along the lake shore from the original fill. And the top picture was taken from a Howard Lake Centennial book. So that's a 1975-76 era Burlington Northern Freight uh, traveling through town. Now on the east side of Howard Lake, this is where the passing sighting ended. And I took this color photograph uh, in 19, excuse me, in uh, 2010, when Milwaukee Road 261 came through Howard Lake, it was westbound and I hung around and they had placed this BNSF train in the siding on the siding that runs between uh, Howard Lake and Smith Lake and sure as heck it left town and came through the uh, control point here. Now there's some, there's some interest here on the, you can see the, there's a radio tower here and a signal hut. Uh, this is the new, uh, Pole line, eliminator radio, uh, pole line eliminator radio system that got rid of the old open wire telephone uh, and telegraph lines. And there's one survivor pole left here for some reason or other, but you can see this is the remote control switch. And they have here, a uh, this little device here is a heater for uh, melting the snow and ice in the switch so that they can operate it uh, via remote control. In the banner up here, I have a picture that uh, of a, uh, uh, that you can get online if you go to this yahoo.com groups ATC monitor. They'll give you the software and it shows you the whole division from Minneapolis all the way up to, uh, I believe all the way up to Fargo. I just grabbed a screenshot here of Howard Lake showing how it's uh, lined up with the switches lined up for a train to uh, go into the siding and other ones lined up to approach that. Uh, you can see they have uh, red lines indicate that the tracks are occupied or uh, aligned, you know, uh, you know, they're not cleared for them to go through. And I had showed you in a picture of the twin stadium uh, the, where the uh, commuter rail uh, trains, they are stored in this part here. So during the, the rush hour, you can see they line this switch up and it goes green and they run trains to and from there to carry passengers, of course, on the commuter line, on the North Star commuter line. Going west of Howard Lake, you come to the town of Smith Lake, which as you can see in this picture, I took this picture back and marked is not there, but it used to be quite a facility. It had railroad uh, coaling towers. It had two churches. It had schools, sawmills, elevators, a cemetery. Uh, there's even supposed to be a locomotive tender buried along the uh, right way here. This, this road is relocated as I'll show you in a couple minutes here, but this is the town of Smith Lake, it was named by Eugen Smith, one of the early surveyors, when he came through this part of the country in 1858 and laid out the line of the railroad. This is a picture, a very old picture of the uh, main line out at Smith Lake showing the saw sawmill that uh, resided along the tracks there, uh, probably circa 1874, somewhere in there. And as you can see in the, uh, in the uh, verbiage here, there were several mills built in this area sawmills, they kept burning down on them. Uh, so the first one dates from 1873. So we know this picture was after that. Uh, I think it's probably again in the 1870s because going by the telegraph line here, it's a single wire telegraph line. There was only one wire on it. And by the 1880s, they'd add more wires uh, because they had more telegraph circuits. I don't know if you can make out the map here, but where this red arrow shows is the, about today where the existing uh, passing sighting from Howard Lake ends with a uh, you know signal shanty and uh, automatic switch machine. But this is where this sawmill was located in Smith Lake uh, during those years up until probably 1900. Uh, this is another early picture of Smith Lake uh, that I found over at the Cocado Historical Society. Uh, they originally said it was a train wreck, but when I looked at it, I realized what it is. It shows the first coaling facility that was employed at Smith Lake. It used a trestle uh, in the map here at the bottom of the red arrow points to where uh, this picture was taken. And they would come in the siding and approach 
the uh, coal dump with uh, a long trestle. And uh, there down here was where the depot was built and they had a water tank here. So this was probably back, you know, I'm guessing it looks like they're all burning coal. So it was probably circa 1890. Uh, the telegraph line hadn't be, been rebuilt yet. And I don't know if anybody has any documentation of what kind of a facility was used to dump so, uh, the coal there onto the locomotive tenders. Uh, I've studied this quite thoroughly, but it's a neat old picture. I believe uh, this train is, uh, this locomotive is on a siding and uh, this one is pulling a string of coal cars. So they must have been loading up the uh, coal docks at that time. Uh, another picture again, taken in the early 1800s before, or eight, late 1800s, uh, probably before 1890, showing the Smith Lake Depot. Uh, you know, again, you can see the water tank in the background. They were still connecting the telegraph lines to the side of the depot with a cross arm. This is the old original St. Paul Pacific Depot. A uh, guy here has a velocity. He must be a railroad guy. He's got his newborn there and his little girl's cradling her baby and kind of a unique hat that she has on. And notice there are four bicycles. Uh, there is, you know, there's a bunch of gentlemen here, a couple of these guys with the vests on are, I believe, railroad workers. But the other guys came down to the depot uh, just to hang out, see what's going on. Today, they drive down there and you know, Mustangs or Camaros or Dodge Challengers or whatever, but back then you traveled via bicycle. Smith Lake then uh, continued to grow and prosper. Uh, the railroad added new coaling facilities, uh, and this is a pretty good view of those. Uh, instead of pushing the cars up with locomotives, they had a gasoline, 18-horse uh, gasoline engine in this shed here, and it, they used, you know, a series of pulleys and winches, and as I said earlier, supposedly had a railroad tender buried in the ground for a counterweight. I don't know if that's true, but uh, a lot of change went on. Uh, when this picture was taken, they had just moved the telegraph lines up to poles on the south side of the track, and that's why there's this white stripe here, and this is the old swift train order signal, which in 1905 was replaced with the uh, semaphore lower quadrant signal, uh, and then, uh, you know, another picture here. So this one probably dates from 1905 to 1918 when, first of all, the depot was moved. And secondly, they went to upper quadrant signals. And you can see they have a load of coal on here uh, to uh, go to the 12 pocket coal chute that was in that facility. Now there's, I went through the AFEs and give you a quick history here of the history, the railroad history of Smith Lake. You can see in 1918, they moved the depot from its original location here west uh, after the curve to straighten it out and re relocated it from the north side of the tracks to the south side of the tracks. The, uh, they, uh, also, there was the, they constructed a uh, 100,000 gallon uh, water tank to replace the old original tank. Uh, so that was located closer to the lake. Uh, they drilled a well back then. And then, you know, the railroad started backing away from Smith Lake. They, uh, they removed the 100,000 gallon tank uh, and the coal chute and incline and the train order signal. That was all removed in the late 20s and in the early 30s, they decided to retire the station and close the agency. And the uh, depot building was sold for $50 to uh, Mr. Adolph Christensen. And because the depot was gone, they still had a uh, the siding switch that terminated the siding from Howard Lake. So they placed a four by four foot telephone booth uh, to, uh, so that the uh, uh, crews could communicate with the dispatcher back in Wilmer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they, they think kind of, that stayed the same up until World War II, when because of increased traffic, they did some improvement to the uh, siding between Smith Lake and Howard Lake. They put in spring switches, and they also had to go to work and build a six by eight foot shelter to have uh, uh, an employee stay there during snowstorms to keep the spring switches clear of snow and ice so that they could traverse, uh, you know, could pull out of the sidings and, and, and save time and money uh, by not getting out and manually throwing the switches. And this, you got a couple of pictures here again of uh, the new water tower in Smith Lake, which eventually in uh, 1921 was moved up to uh, Alouez, uh, Wisconsin up uh, by Superior. And then, of course, we have the uh, view of the Smith Lake Depot, which was relocated west. This is it showing its 19 location. Uh, and eventually, of course, it was torn down. And this is uh, found some views here of the switch shanty that they uh, put up in, during World War II for uh, temporarily, temporarily sheltering the guy that was charged with keeping the switches clear of ice and snow. 
pretty basic structure, just had a stove, it had a dirt floor, they didn't even insulate it. Uh, and they said, well, there's only gonna be somebody in there temporarily, but they did throw a cot in there and had a coal box. Now, when they use, uh, installed centralized traffic control, the uh, switch at Smith Lake was changed over to a motorized uh, uh, remote control switch. And they used this system here uh, run by compressed air with a pipe in between the, the rails and where the switch rods connect to blow uh, with bursts of air, uh, the snow and ice uh, away from the switch. Uh, that's since been replaced with a more modern system that uses a, uh, uh, uses a heater and, uh, and fans. And of course the switches were, in, as were the heaters and uh, blowers controlled by the CTC uh, panel in Wilmer and eventually in Minneapolis. Now to, uh, we've got here an aerial view of Smith Lake. And uh, this was these, I got these views from the Borkart Map Library down at the University of Minnesota. I put an arrow here in the left in the top view showing you can see uh, in 1937, October, I think 27th when this uh, was uh, taken, uh, a train was heading east. And in the red uh, circle I outlined, I blew that up on the bottom half of the photograph showing how they, uh, you know, first of all, you don't see much in the way of railroad facilities here. Everything, the, you know, the, the coaling facility, the water tank is all gone, the depot is gone. Uh, they also, uh, the township decided to move the road uh, closer down to parallel the railroad right away. And right in this area here was the town cemetery. And they, you know, they tore down, the, <laughs> they said, well, a lot of the tombstones were made out of wood, so they decayed and they farm this. So the people that used to lay in the cemetery that were putting up, uh, pushing up daisies are now laying there still today and pushing up corn and soybeans. Uh, it was, uh, the rest of the town just disappeared. By the 1970s, when they moved the road, Smith Lake was gone. Uh, just the, the uh, uh, remote control siding switch is down in this area today and nothing but a single track there. You wouldn't even know that there was a town there. So I got all inspired and poetic and I'm gonna to recite to you rather than sing to you, the ode to Smith Lake. There is no tower tank or telegraph line. The station stores and school closed long ago. No house of God or even mortal man remains. Just a cemetery brimming with lonesome unmarked graves. The town now lay in an empty field. Its dirt is all furrowed and barren. The souls that once lived here are left behind their names forgotten by the uncaring. Near the siding switch, track signals stand guard, their light beacons both welcome and warning. They beckon from afar to trains and their crews, come to this place where a town once lived and then died so long ago. Just its time now haunts this tangle of weeds and wood. Only the memory of those who are quit can ever again make it so. Now, if we follow Horadro Alger's advice and go west, we come to Cocado. And you can see in the top photograph here, uh, the picture of uh, a steam locomotive. And I, I put an arrow here to draw your attention. This is the morning train out of the cities. And I believe this was prior to, <clears throat> oh, it was probably prior to, well, it was certainly prior to uh, the 1900 rebuild of the telegraph line, because this is the old original telegraph, or the second telegraph line with just five wires on it. But the red arrow points to a kind of a neat device that I haven't seen on any other old uh, pictures of steam locomotives. And apparently this allows the engineer to drop this facility here for plowing snow, this, uh, this metal structure. I, I, I haven't, maybe other people that are more fluent in steam locomotives have seen it, but uh, it was, I caught that when I was uh, studying this photograph. And this, of course, is the original St. Paul and Pacific Depot that was replaced by the, this newer structure, the, the Cocado de, uh, Depot, Great Northern Depot. And this, this photograph, again, was taken in the early 1930s, shows a uh, diesel electric car 2341 pulling a, you know, a, a coach. And my mother used to ride the uh, train uh, during World War II from Waverly into uh, Minneapolis, where she worked at Van Heusen Air. She would stay there. And so she rode the train back and forth on weekends. And I asked her, I said, wow, what, what kind of locomotive pulled it? And she couldn't remember. So this may have been what was doing uh, the, the work there, the diesel electric car, as opposed to the gas electrics that the loose line used. And this is a rather uh, monumental picture because this is uh, the depot agent, the last depot agent in Cocado, uh, Waldo Tesh, 
Uh, this photograph was supposedly taken for the bicentennial. As you can see, there's a 1974 picture uh, or a calendar on the wall. Uh, but uh, this was kind of the end of uh, an era for, uh, you know, for the, the railroad. The depot agents, they were closing the agencies and pulling the depot agents out of town. And these small towns started to lose their connection with the railroad. I mean, it's still there, but there aren't a lot of people that you can go down and talk to the, the agent and uh, uh, shoot the breeze and find out what trains are coming through. Uh, the railroad is gone from small town America in that respect. Here is Dassel, and this is another very old picture uh, going back to the 1870s that the Dassel uh, Historical Society provided me. And I believe what you're seeing here in this picture is the locomotive Wyzetta, which was down uh, in that early view, that Upton view of downtown Minneapolis at the depot number one. And they have a flat car here and a group of people standing there. And I think what these guys did was unloaded this thing here, which may have been a, a table for a scale. Uh, but, uh, you know, nobody knows there's no documentation just from an old tin type picture and the depot is still new. They don't have their brick chimney. Uh, several years later, this bottom picture shows, you know, they've installed a, dick, a brick chimney and it's the Dassel Depot. But again, with the lower quadrant uh, train order signal. So that was prior to December of 1918 when they had upgraded them all. And in this map here, you can see when St. Paul and Pacific came to town, they originally swung around the south of Spring Lake. Later on, the railroad straightened this grade out and, uh, uh, and, 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 of course, rebuilt it, leveled it off. And Smith Lake, or Spring Lake, excuse me, was also a water source for the uh, Great Northern. They had a, a pump down here, and they pumped out a Spring Lake to the uh, tank up by the depot, which you can see in the upper right corner. This is the newer tank at the depot. And what's interesting about this picture, this picture is from the 1930s, probably 35, 36, is this old bridge that goes across here was actually uh, not only carried a road across the tracks, but was also used to dump sugar beets. Uh, they had in uh, where the red arrow shows here, they had a trap door in the road and they could uh, place a gondola under there and dump sugar, sugar beets uh, to be shipped by rail uh, from the big town of Dassel, Minnesota, which like I say, was a, uh, uh, you know, uh, fairly important place along the railroad because it was where they took water and uh, you see it's picture in a lot of books. Now, if you go out to Wilmer and go up to the, the uh, uh, museum to see the P2 up there, uh, they of course built their museum around the Candy Ojai Depot. And this is an old picture, again, prior to the 1918 uh, uh, train order signal upgrade showing Candy Ojai. And so they still have the telegraph wires, uh, you know, tacked cross arms nailed to the side of the building terminating in the bay. And, uh, uh, and of course we get to Wilmer itself. And again, a couple of old pictures, Wilmer has been very thoroughly documented, but this top picture is a composite picture showing, you know, going way back to probably one of the first depots, if not the first depot in Wilmer, uh, showing the facilities then. The bottom colorized picture shows the uh, depot that served Wilmer up through World War II. And I used to be a lineman, so I, I this terminating uh, these telegraph telephone lines here have 12 pin cross arms on them as opposed to the standard 10 for those of you that are technical geeks and are into telephony and uh, things of that nature. But the uh, railroad uh, demolished that facility and in the uh, south side of it concurrently built the new facility. And earlier today, somebody said, were there any inside pictures of this facility? And, we did have, I do have one here in my display, and this shows the second floor on the north side. Uh, it shows the telegraph room. Uh, the guy here with the visor on is a fellow called the wire chief, and his, his job was to keep all the telegraph and telephone circuits working and functioning. So he has a big meter here, and there's a patch panel and a, a, a phone that, you know, a, that can hang, uh, you know, a breast phone to hang there and headphones. And the four gentlemen in the back are telegraphers, and of course, Wilmer used to be where the, uh, you know, the main line crossed the line from Sioux Falls that went all the way up to St. Cloud. So these guys would relay telegraph messages to towns uh, on, you know, going the four directions. I'm not, I don't know what the young lady's job description was, but I'm hoping somewhere in the world, somebody will see this picture and can say, oh, one of these, I recognize one of these guys. Uh, but that was Wilmer 1948 in the new uh, Wilmer Depot up in the second floor. And I, I had said earlier that the uh, railroad ran telephone 
telegraph lines. And so one of the things before radio, uh, they would in all the passenger trains and the baggage car, they would have a portable telephone with what they call line poles. And the line poles had a couple clips on them that as you can see in this Western Electric News uh, uh, painting, it shows the, uh, somebody talking, you know, fireman or conductor, somebody talking to the dispatcher via the telephone wires to facilitate them finding those wires, the pole line, and this is a picture that was taken in the 90s while the wires were still up. They would mark the cross arms with the dispatcher's pair with a, uh, a white D. And there's also, you can see a, the message circuit was marked with an M. But this is the way they communicated before uh, radio, you know, after World War II, radio became uh, more portable and more, uh, you know, didn't need heavy duty or didn't consume as much energy or as much power transistors came in and uh, made all of this, this system obsolete, but blast the past. And of course, this is a bell paired boiler locomotive. So it could be GM, but it's probably out on the, uh, out on the you know, out on the Pennsylvania. Now this picture, this picture here is of, uh, Whitey Larson, this picture was taken after the St. Paddy's Day blizzard of 1965. Uh, this is uh, east of uh, Wilmer, where the, uh, the tracks are over here on the right. They're just thoroughly buried. And this shows Mr. Larson digging out uh, the, some of the pole line. This is uh, his, his signal, the, the centralized traffic control signal and ADS signals all ran on the third cross arm here and were all buried in snow. So he was digging out this pole and uh, it was during the 60s, we had tremendous snowstorms up here in Minnesota. We had a lot of snow. So uh, this was uh, something that's eliminated now that they've eliminated uh, the pole lines. And finally, I'd like to close with uh, uh, the railroad president's lament. I talked about depot agents and surveyors and civil engineers and linemen, uh, but I found this picture of James Hill and I remembered this uh, this poem that my dad bought home. I think somebody, it had a picture, he bought it home it was on a piece of paper with a picture of a steam locomotive. I think somebody gave it to him in a bar and it had this poem, the, prayer, the railroad president's lament. So we'll close today by saying, I don't get to run the engine or even ring the bell, but let the train run off the track and see who catches hell. So now we probably know why Mr. Hill looks so stern in this picture. And I'd like to close by thanking uh, several people and organizations that helped me. I, I had mentioned Mr. Bronchad passed away just recently, but these other folks uh, gave freely of their time and uh, loaned their uh, artifacts and things for, to help me uh, uh, do my article on telegraphy on the open wire line between Minneapolis and Wilmer that was published back in March. So thank you very much, folks. That's my uh, talk for the day. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Um, Dan, are there any questions out there? Yep, we've got two here. Um, one was, does anybody know if there was a small yard at Waverly? In Waverly? Yes, uh, they had, uh, uh, first of all, it was the end of the passing track from Montrose, but they had a, a, a track that went around the north side of the depot. Uh, that was kind of like a house track. And then on the south side, there was a local passing track that just extended the width of Waverly. And then there was a track that serviced the elevators and the uh, stockyards in Waverly. So there were, you know, the main line and, you know, three other tracks. Okay, and the uh, other one's actually more of a, a kudos to you. And um, from Andrew who says, great presentation, Gary. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and material on this line. And I have to add, yeah, it was fascinating. I appreciate the time you've taken in looking into this. This has been fun. Okay, thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. Really enjoyed it. I think everybody else did too. So thank you very much. Uh, it is now. 2.54, so we have about a uh, six minute break and then we move into the final part of the day. Okay. Hey Tom. Yes? You're recording these presentations. When, were, when will they be available for viewing later on if needed? Uh, probably, well, not till after I'm back from holidays, the end of next week. Okay, thank you.